Hi again, this is DeSalony, and welcome to episode 9 of 90s Overlooked Under Hood. So in this episode, we're heading back to the USA, or not. Uh, that should become clear as the video proceeds. Anyway, um, at this point in the 90s, the kind of um, the US kind of post hardcore bands, um, I guess you could roughly categorize them into a few kind of groups. Uh, they were the kind of the noisy, abrasive, confrontational types. They were the very politically switched on, kind of community focused activist types. And then there were the ones that were just kind of just nurturing this increasingly melodic and almost kind of pop kind of sound. So um, the two bands and the, their two albums today definitely fall into that latter kind of popier, more melodic um, category. Uh, but they are completely worlds apart. So the first album today is the self-titled album by the band Manifesto, which was released at some time in 1992. So bands change, they develop, they kind of, uh, they mature, they evolve. But this is one of the strangest evolutions, um, I think, in this list. Manifesto. Um, the main member, the kind of the creative core of Manifesto, is the band's songwriter, Michael Hampton, who was a fairly key and very active member of the Washington DC kind of hardcore scene in the United States. Uh, he played with some pretty big hitters early on, whilst they were all kind of forging their sounds. Uh, in 1980, he played in a small band called State of Alert with someone called Henry Garfield, who later changed his name to Henry Rollins. Um, and there are a whole bunch of Washington DC hardcore bands of this period that Michael Hampton went on to play in. He played in The Faith uh, in about 1983, early, 90, early 80s, with uh, Alec Mackay, who was the brother of Fugazi, uh, guitarist, singer Ian Mackay. Uh, in 1985, um, he joined a band called Embrace with Ian Mackay. Uh, it was his first post-Minor Threat band. And um, Embrace are credited often as one of the earliest uh, emo bands, which is a term that Ian Mackay himself hated. But, um, but yep, there's Michael Hampton. And following the demise of Embrace, he joined a band called One Last Wish. This would be about 1986, 87, featuring Edward Janney, Brendan Canty, and Guy Picotto. Again, another very early influential emo band, which just happened to also contain two other members of Fugazi. This is like a who's who of the American hardcore scene of the very... Uh, early through to the late 80s. And um, there's Michael Hampton of Manifesto right in the thick of it. So, Manifesto, which formed in 1990. This is not a hardcore band. This is not a post-hardcore band. Manifesto exhibited a huge change in direction from the music that Michael Hampton had been involved in up until that point. The sound is a kind of sleek, very well-mannered kind of classic 1980s UK style indie guitar pop. Think bands like Felt, The Close Lobsters, um, Micro Disney. I know they were Irish, not British. So um, The Flatmates, The Pastels, Jangly, shambly, 1980s, indie pop. 
very polite, very clean, very poppy. Not really what you'd expect from someone who had come up through the American hardcore scene in Washington, D.C. I think another little kind of tell in the sound of Manifesto is I can hear a fair smattering of the output of Wire in the 1980s. Their cleaner, poppier kind of stuff like Kidney Bingos and Eardrum Buzz. I hear quite a lot of that in this sound, which may provide some kind of window into into um, how someone could go from hardcore to this kind of indie pop. Because uh, Wire were one of the big influences on um, on the early 80s US hardcore scene. So um, I think the main reason this album is is uh, overlooked is because it's just really, really terrible timing. Um, literally just as the kind of shoegaze bands of the UK indie scene were discovering noisy American bands like Sonic Youth and the Butthole Surfers and Dinosaur Jr., uh, Big Black, um, it appears that Michael Hampton was moving in exactly the opposite direction. And um, yeah, it's easy to see how this album just didn't pick up an audience. This is the band's only album. They did release a few singles uh, and EPs, and I'm not going to claim this is the greatest record in the world. I'm not going to claim it's the greatest record on this list, but it's actually pretty good. Um, there are a few caveats to that. It is very clean and the the production is pretty slick and smooth. Um, you could argue that the Smiths kind of uh, are responsible for this, but that's one for another day. Um, I think another problem you might have hearing this for the first time is that it does use some programmed drums, um, which do sound rather dated. Uh, I believe Michael Hampton was responsible for those as well, so there's nowhere really to hide for that. But anyway, there's some good things about this record. Um, the opener, Pattern 26, really highlights uh, Michael Hampton's voice, which is this very world, world-weary world kind of uh, John Lennon-esque type vocal style, uh, which he pits against um, this odd kind of clanging harmonic chord progression. Um, it really works. It's a good song. It kind of pulls you into the album. Um, later on, uh, the track E-Dub, um, this shows possibly where some of his hardcore um, roots are kind of showing through because um, dub reggae techniques were beloved of many uh, US hardcore bands. Um, and uh, this track is full of them. Um, it's got this kind of shiny but downbeat kind of atmospheric take on dub reggae. Um, it's it's a good sound and um, the dub bass really kind of brings this one alive. And uh, later we get a kind of a, a track called Down the Line, which is again, this kind of very shiny, very slick, those words again, but this melancholic, jangly kind of number with a lovely, it's got a lovely chorus. And um, yeah, the warmth and the kind of this strange familiarity of Michael Hampton's voice, um, it saves so many of the songs on this on this record from just being a another indie pop record. Yeah, this is a this is a good album, not great. Um, with just which just happens to have a very interesting backstory to it. Um, you are going to have to look over some of the more dated kind of sounds on the album. Uh, the last track on the album is called "Walking Backwards," and that's got some very problematic kind of baggy sounds, some Italian house piano and some shuffling drum beats and some wah-wah that, that really don't work in that context. But across the album, the songwriting is solid. Um, it's got a slightly kind of cloying 80s indie pop 
kind of goth light feel to it. But if you're in the right mood, that stuff can be quite addictive. I mean, this is this one is definitely overlooked and underheard. Um, whether that makes it worthy for your attention or not, I'm not sure. But give it a listen and make your own mind up. So for the second album today, I'd like to talk about Pull by Ark Welder, which was released in February of 1993. Again, if you hark back to the beginning of this video, Ark Welder are firmly in the more melodic, kind of poppier side of post-hardcore. But they stay with a foot in that kind of noisier arena. Um, if you think of post-hardcore bands, well, quite possibly one of the biggest post-hardcore bands, um, Husker Du, uh, Ark Welder draw a lot from them. Uh, they also happen to come from Minneapolis, the uh, home of Husker du, and they're also a power trio, as I guess you call them, guitar, bass, drums. I say the noisier side, they, they don't ever kind of spill over into kind of avant-garde, difficult noise, but it's that kind of noisier chainsaw kind of fuzzy pop that Husker du really excelled in. Um, that's where Ark Welder live. Um, there was an alternate kind of take on this kind of poppier, more melodic post-hardcore, which kind of goes more along the lines of that kind of scruffy, lovelorn kind of pop-punk sound that people like the Buzzcocks and the Ramones um, pioneered. It's kind of faster and more sugary, almost cartoonish. And for that, you think of bands like, you know, like The Descendants, maybe, Green Day, even some of the early Lemonheads albums. But that's not Ark Welder. Um, in fact, you can tell by some of the bands that they shared bills with that they were they were drawn to the noisier side. Uh, they just happened to be able to write killer songs. Um, they toured with Tar, they toured with Jesus Lizard, they, they toured with Jawbox. Um, these were all quite noisy, kind of abrasive bands. But clearly, uh, Ark Welder were happier sharing bells with bands like that. So Ark Welder are um, a pair of brothers, uh, Rob and Bill Graber and Scott MacDonald on drums. This is their third album, and this one's on Touch and Go. I've mentioned them a few times before, but you can't get away from the fact that they do owe a huge debt to the sound of Husker Du. I would say particularly the kind of flip your wig era of Husker du, um, where they'd taken the noise and the melody literally as far as they could go on uh, SST, on their indie label, and shortly after they would jump to a major label and change their sound even more. I think Ark Welder captured this kind of period of Husker du, that sound, very well, and they give it a shot of their own personality. The Husker du comparisons are aided by the fact that um, Scott McDonald, the drummer, who would also sing on some numbers, is a dead ringer vocally for Bob Mould. Uh, it's quite spooky. <laughs> um, some key tracks. Um, uh, what did you call it that for is a good one. Um, it opens with this feedback, which gives way to this kind of pounding, insistent drum beat. And then you get this kind of ooh, slithery kind of melody that works its way in with Scott McDonald singing with this, which gives way to this huge killer kind of classic Husker style, catchy chorus. Uh, it's really nice stuff. Um, yeah, really good song. And another one so, uh, Scott sings on uh, would be It's a Wonderful Lie. Um, again, the guitars are kind of dialed back a bit here. So they're, they're in that kind of dirty, clean kind of register. Um, but it's got this very nice verse chorus structure, which kind of just gets kicked into another gear by this amazing key change um, in the bridge section. It uh, really kind of spins the song on its axis. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really neat songwriting trick. And it's a great song. Arkwell are also 
obviously listened to uh, quite a lot of classic rock and um, on a couple of tracks, the kind of Eastern inspired melodies that they pull out on their uh, guitars um, are very, very redolent of kind of uh, Led Zeppelin, particularly kind of Kashmir era Led Zeppelin. Uh, there's an instrumental track called Cranberry Sauce, which, yeah, has this kind of pummeling Middle Eastern style melody, which just kind of um, just plows headlong. It's just a, this kind of unstoppable kind of crushing instrumental number. Um, yeah, imagine kind of Led Zeppelin and Fagazi kind of trying to kind of jam together. You're in that kind of ballpark. And on the track La Habim, they use very similar kind of melodic tricks, these kind of vaguely Middle Eastern sounding guitar riffs and melodies. But there are vocals on this one. And um, they're quite funny vocals as well, because they're clearly pushing the kind of classic rock, thunderous kind of button with these kind of huge, heavy kind of intonations of La Habim. Um, it's funny. It's killer. Um yeah, it's uh, it's a really good song. <laughs> yeah, the track "Just Not Moving" is also pretty fun. This one's closer to a kind of a more, um, a more kind of UK alternative sound. It's far less, um, far less kind of centered on that Midwestern post-hardcore sound. Um, yeah, very melodic, great vocals, um, great backing vocals. They could do the harmony thing just as well as Husker do, and that really shines through on a track like this. Okay, it's that time again. I'm going to ask you to do it, except I'm not. Please come and join me again for another episode of 90s Overlooked Underheard. See you again.